You know, there's nothing that makes my day more than getting an email from some random person in the universe who just bought an iPad over in the UK and tells me the story about how it's the coolest product they've ever brought home, you know, in their lives. That's what keeps me going. That's great. That was, I think, uh, <laughs> I think that was his last interview. I think it was just before he died. Um, so let's talk about the current moment. I would love each of you to reflect on how, uh, you can't guess what he was going to think or anything else, but what Steve would think of the current moment in your estimation. Again, we don't know, obviously. Um, Tim, why don't we start with you? The, the current moment at Apple or the current well, moment in the world? In the world at Apple? Oh, I think at Apple, uh, I believe and hope that he would be proud over a day like this where we bring out a lot of innovations that um, are very much on the principles that he laid out and articulated so well. Uh, I think the, the greater world he would be uh, troubled by a, a lot of things that he sees, the sort of the part, partisanship and, and the division in the world. and, and uh, but I think he would be happy that we're living up to the values that he talked about so much, like privacy, uh, l like protecting the environment. Uh, these were, were core to him while we're keeping up innovation and, and uh, trying to give people something that uh, enables them to do something they couldn't do otherwise, to, to give them tools to, to discover their own self and to change the world in their own way. Uh, but I, I, I think, you know, so I think it would be mixed. Uh, but I, and I hate to project right. kind of what he would think today. I really don't like to do that. Uh, but I, I, I think, you know, we, there are lots of challenges in the world today. Mm -hmm. Laurie? Mm. Um, it's true that this is, this, that's an impossible hypothetical, but because we, we knew him so very well for a long time. Um, in, in many ways, he inhabits each of us. And for me, uh, a, often the way I make sense of the world, I have sort of, you know, the resonance of his voice in my head often. Um, he would be very disappointed with the political climate. I would say. Um, not only the polarization, not only the fact that people are really um, coming to blows mm -hmm. you know, within families and communities in our country, but also just that he loved our country so much. He loved California so much, but he loved our country. He loved the idea of America. He loved what it allowed the individual and the communities to become. Um, he loved the unfetteredness of it. He, he loved the personal freedoms and liberties, but also the connectedness and responsibility for each other. It was very important to him to be able to give something back to the human experience. And I think he, he, would, be, he would not be quiet <laughs> about the Would he be on Twitter? Would he be on Twitter? No. I, I mean, he wasn't a big fan of social media, um, it, mainly because of the business model. Mm -hmm. um, but he would not be on Twitter. No, he would be speaking out easily um, mm -hmm. and often. Yeah. His emails and letters were like tweets, though. They were short and kind of sweet. I remember when you uh, introduced uh, Ping. Uh, Ping? Ping. Ping. That was some social network. Um, yeah, he came out. Really well. He came out of the room. You know, he comes out after he gives a speech in the room where people are looking at things, and he came out and he goes, "What do you think?" I said, "I think it sucks." And he goes, oh, "I think so." <laughs> <laughs> right away. Um, and he goes, "I hate social media," which was interesting. And it wasn't because he wasn't social or anything like that. He just didn't couldn't figure it out. Johnny, what do you think? Not on that particular uh, ping, because it, it did stuff, <laughs> but go ahead. Um, it's certainly disappointed. I would actually, I, I don't know, I, I could imagine being, him being sort of mad slash furious, but also combined with, um, you know, that, that sort of compassion and love for the ideals that Lorene 
Lorene described. Um, I think both of those are fabulous fuels to be effective. Mm -hmm. And I think he would have bought his um, curiosity and a lack of fear to, to have ideas. Um, but I, I think certainly would have felt that, you know, there's an imperative here. Um, but you know, you know, when he used to talk about it's important that you, f you know, you find what it is you love. Mm -hmm. I used to think that was because, you know, it's nice to film, feel warm in your tummy. Mm -hmm. He actually described that as being, you know, because it's, if you're going to do something that's really hard, mm. you need that sort of fuel. Mm -hmm. and, and fury and love, I think, are wonderful fuels. And I would, I would expect they would be a mixture of both. So talk a little bit about the, one of the things that he did, and it got a lot of, it gets attention now and again, his quotes, and it was at a code, it was at a code conference, uh, or an All Things D conference, about privacy. That was something he talked about very clearly, plain English and everything else. Where do you think, this is something you've done at Apple a lot, it's been a big core value to the company, it's been good for market, people feel safer on it, um, it's good for sales. Talk a little bit about the issues around privacy now, how you're looking at. Yeah, you know, uh, Steve really ingrained in the company in the early days the importance of privacy. Mm -hmm. And it has only grown with every year that has passed since then. Mm -hmm. He saw in, I think it was uh, at D8 that he spoke about privacy here mm -hmm. in 2010, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he put it in such eloquent and simple terms. Mm -hmm. It means asking people's permission, mm -hmm. asking them repeatedly. And it has been at the heart of how we view privacy. And so, you know, we, we, we believe that privacy is a fundamental human right. And we see a world where privacy uh, takes a back seat and you have this sort of um, surveillance kind of mode everywhere that this is a world where people begin to do less and think less they begin to alter their behavior because they know they're being watched. Yeah. And this is not a world that any of us want to, to live in. I think he saw that and saw that well. And I you know, have every reason to believe that uh, he would have uh, put up a, a good arguments and good fights a, along the way. Which you have been attempting to do in lots of yes. ways, whether it's around advertising or anything else. Well, what, uh, what we felt is that people should own their data and they should make their own decision. And so what we believed is that people should be empowered to be able to make that decision in a really straightforward and simple manner, uh, not buried 95 pages deep in a privacy policy somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th that's the way that we've looked at it and we continue as each year goes by to try to give our users to empower them to make those decisions for themselves. And you, you see the features that we've rolled out over time that, that do that. We're, we are not trying to make the decision for them. Well, you have by, by de facto become, because of this, this core value of this company started by Steve, you've become the de facto regulator in that regard because regulators haven't stepped in. Yeah, we're not, we're not just trying to be a regulator, Kara. We're, all, all we're trying to do is give people the ability to make the decision for themselves. Do they want to be tracked? Is this something that they're by freely making the decision to do? And so we're presenting them the ability to make that decision. And we, we just keep trying to do that more and more and more as time goes on. So Johnny, we were talking earlier about care, when we talked earlier this week about care and design. And that's another thing, because a lot of the stuff that's been rolled out that have been privacy violations have been rolled out without care. That's, you know, without, I think, without consequences. Without intentionality or just lack of caring about the consequences. Talk a little bit about the idea of care and design. I, I think, in, I mean, care is a tough word in some ways to, to understand. I think it's easy to understand carelessness, mm -hmm. which is, I see, you know, being a disregard. For, for, for people. Um, you know, carelessness to me is just seeing people as a potential revenue stream, not the reason to work moderately hard to really express your love and appreciation for the rest of the species. So for, for, for us in our, our 
practice of design. I, I think care is, is very often felt and not, not necessarily seen. And I think And I, I know it's something that I think the three of us feel strongly about, that that, that sort of care that, that is, I mean, Steve talked about, you know, the carpenter, the cabinet maker, that would finish the back of the drawer. Mm -hmm. And it's that you, you're bothered beyond whether something is actually publicly seen. Mm -hmm. You do it not because there's a, I don't know, an economic interest. Mm -hmm. you do it because it's the right moral decision. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I, think it's, I think particularly as a designer, I think it's very often in the very small small quiet things, like worrying about how you package a cable. Or, 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 you clearly or, worry about that a lot. Yeah. I worry about that ever such a lot. And, <laughs> and, and Steve worried about that a, a mm -hmm. lot as well. And I think um, I think it's that sort of, that preoccupation. You know, when you're sat there on a Sunday afternoon worrying about the cable that's packaged as a, a zigzag thing and you're going to take that little wire tie off when you're sat there on a Sunday afternoon worrying about this isn't really very good the only reason and I think you're very aware that the reason you are there is because I think our species deserves better mm -hmm. it deserves some thought mm -hmm. um, and it's a lovely way of, of I don't know I think you feel connected Right. I remember once walking back from visiting him when, when they made, uh, when uh, Microsoft made their, what was it, the Zoom? Zoom. The Zoom. The Zoom. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know what you're well, yeah, well it, was a, it was a Microsoft version of the iPod, really. And apparently, Walt, he, he had not seen it, and Walt handed it to him, and this is what he did. Walt handed it to him, and he went like this. <laughs> very dramatic, very steep. He goes, I cannot touch that. It's disgusting, um, essentially. Um, you know, he's doing it for Walt's benefit, but he was repulsed by the design. He was repulsed by the, what it was, whether it worked or not, I don't care. When you talk about this, this idea of care around creation, because you, you're doing a whole lot of different things now, um, but the idea of, uh, that seemed to be something that mattered, and some people thought it was details, business, whatever it was. How do you look at that? Um, I think that Steve early on in his life developed out a very full aesthetic sense. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, certainly before um, I did, and and he noticed details of everything. The way that the floor meets the wall. meets the ceilings, the way that, that the lights um, are either recessed or not recessed, whether or not the, the sky design allows for the kind of illumination that it's meant for, all things like that. He was very, very much aware of, of both the physical and the natural environment. Um, he was animated by the environment as well and I think um, as I mentioned he loved California he, he really loved California he loved the natural beauty and the light of it and um, the sense of openness and possibility and I think that that allowed him to have a much broader sense of, of what his life could be as well um, I think that you know if people People made fun of us for years because in our house we couldn't agree on a sofa or chairs. So <laughs> for many, many years we had neither. Um, <laughs> but, but mainly because um, we, we really, you know, there were so many details that we had to agree on. Yeah. Um, and we, we finally did. Yeah, um, but it, I think it took about eight years. Oh, wow. <laughs> it wasn't just a thing. I don't like couches. Because there's a lot of pictures of him without couches. 
a lot of, if yeah, I Yeah, well, that was a, that's that, why. Okay. That was a real thing. So one of the things was the idea of what, how to wield power, Tim. And y under your leadership, since uh, you took over, Apple is enorm has become enormous. Um, it was a much smaller company when Steve, uh, when Steve was running it. How do you look at that idea? Because you know, one of the things that Apple's undergoing now, is, is all of tech is undergoing is scrutiny around power, about the power that these companies have over people. Um, I'd love you to sort of reflect on the idea of what the, the concepts were at the beginning, because one of the things Steve did was push against power, that famous ad, obviously. Um, and he talked about it a lot, uh, the idea of, of he didn't seem to like power, but now this is probably the most powerful company in tech, or one of them. You know, we don't think in those terms. Okay. That's not how we think. We, we think about um, our values, and we, we think about uh, using any platform that we might have to expand those values. And so we, we just talked about privacy, but environment is another one. You know, we touch a lot of companies around the world uh, because we manufacture things. And we know that we have a responsibility to, to convince those companies to use renewable energy and to recycle and, and to do things that are in, sustainable. Um, so that's the lens that we look at it through, not, not the lens of power and, and wielding it. I mean, in a lot of ways, uh, the company is still run the way Steve set it up. How it's would still, you describe that? It's still a functional-based company. You know, we don't have uh, these many P&Ls in, the, in that where people fight about what costs are allocated to which P&L and those sorts of things. We have one for the company. Mm -hmm. And we have someone that owns software and someone that owns hardware and someone that owns technology and someone that owns design. And there, it's a... It's a great partnership and collaboration. Uh, and it was something that he demanded of people, was, was this idea of collaboration and the idea that small teams could do incredible things together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he ran a meeting every Monday. Johnny will remember this well, at 9 o'clock. Oh. And no matter where you were, you were in that meeting at 9 o'clock on Monday. And this it is would, in... He would get the top people of the company together, Cupertino. and we'd go through everything in the company that was key. We still run that same meeting on that same day at that same time. Mm -hmm. And so a, a lot of the things that he brought uh, that aren't talked about very much, uh, they, they live on mm -hmm. the, in terms of the principles and, and so forth that, that he utilized. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't sit around and say, what would Steve do? He told us not to do that. Right. But the reality is that he was uh, the best teacher I've ever had, by far. And, and those teachings live on. And not just in me, because it's in a whole uh, bunch of people that, mm -hmm. that are there. So give me a few of those teaching from your perspective. What was well, the most he, he, was always a, he was always on that Apple should make the best products, not the most. Well, yes. And so that looking at things from that lens changes everything, mm -hmm. right? And, and in reality, and sometimes those two align and you, the best is the most. Mm -hmm. But many times it doesn't. And many times it won't because, right. the, because uh, products become commoditized over time in, in certain uh, fields like the personal computer business that really happened to. Elliot, uh, thank you very much. Um, so this gentleman certainly needs no introduction. Uh, my name is Mark Bezos, and uh, you're all welcome to call me what my friends do. They usually just refer to me as Jeff's brother. Uh, so <laughs> by the way, just so you know, it actually does go both ways. My brother has a TED talk about small acts of kindness, uh, being a volunteer firefighter, and it has millions of views. And every once in a while, somebody will stop me and say, I love your TED talk about being a firefighter and small acts of kindness. And 
I, I, if I, I usually you know, say, well, thank you, but that's really my brother, his TED Talk. But if I'm in a hurry, I, I just say thank you. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> so thank you. Yes, absolutely. But if any of you do get confused, I'm the one with the smaller bank account uh, to your left. <laughs> he, so. He's the big brother. He's, um, so, Jeff, before we get started, I think you know, this is a, 